Well, with that, I am honored to invite our latest guest, Stacy, to Open Talk. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you today? I'm super duper. How are you? I'm doing well. So good to see you again. I'm glad you could join us. Thanks for having me. I and for those that don't know, where, where are you, uh, I guess, uh, calling in from? I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, technically nice. a small town called Harleyville. Very nice. Very nice. And we're going to just jump straight into it because we have a lot to discuss with you and go back in our wonderful time machine to uh, where were you born? I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. My dad was Navy. So we were right outside the Naval Air Station and my mom was a homemaker. Ah, very nice. And did you did you move around a lot or was that sort of home base for a while? I was in Corpus for exactly six months. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then my dad got transferred to Bermuda. Oh, which wow. People are, are always ask me, how was it there? And I say, I wasn't old enough to know. <laughs> how often did you find yourself moving year to year? Uh, yeah, a lot. Um, yeah. We moved from Bermuda to um, Florida and then Florida to Chicago, Chicago to uh, uh, Iowa, Iowa, oh Alaska, Alaska, South Dakota. And then I graduated and then I joined the service myself. Oh so. my God. So, so from like elementary school, like, was that, uh, the, did you have friends that like stayed with you or was it every year kind of difficult for you because you're always new people always like, and did that upset you or was that just normal for you? I think I was so adaptive at that point that I, I kind of got restless after a certain amount of time ready to have a new start. And that was kind of the fun part with every new move, you could be whoever you wanted to be. Yeah. So was it local high schools that you were going to, or was it schools, uh, local schools and elementary and high schools that you were going to, or? Right. Just yeah. the, lo the local um, schools. The last school I went to was very small and the graduating, my graduating class was um, I think 80. And we had a population in that town of um, 2,787 when I graduated. Wow. Yeah. wow. And if you, if you were, they were going to make a movie, you know, uh, and you were in that uh, high school click, what click would it be? Oh, um, it's kind of probably the, the nerd. Mate. No, yeah, yeah. The I, freak no. Two geeks. Yeah. I, think, I think the artist, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I know, like I look back in my yearbook, it just happened. I was, I moved recently and I was going through a bunch of old, um, you know, foot lockers and things. And I found my yearbook and there I was in the art room working on a sculpture and they said most artistic or something. Oh, oh, I oh guess. back then. So what, what, yeah. what were your interests back there? And that uh, was it, it wasn't photography yet, was it? Or was it? Uh... I had taken, uh, we had a black and white lab in my school. I had taken a photography class that I sucked at it. It took was that a in high school? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it took a lot of technical prowess and I was an artist. I just wanted to see, like, take what I saw in my head and splash it on some canvas. Um, <laughs> so I did a lot more sketching, drawing, uh, other mediums, paint. So in high school, what were, were you, uh, was it uh, kind of movies and books or like, running around outside with friends? What was sort of your thing, uh, you know, when, as, uh, and what type of people were you hanging out with? Uh, <laughs> not the right kind, um, <laughs> I, I'm told. And, you know, you look back, you're like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done a lot of those things, but I was a kid. It's yeah. a learning experience. Um, movies, I love movies, comedies. Uh, I like a good, um, I like paranormal shows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're coming on to Halloween. My oh, favorite, uh, this my is favorite, favorite time of the season, right? <laughs> yes. I'm, and I did a lot of art. So I spent a lot of my, my spare time doing art. And I'm a horse person. Oh. When, I, when I wasn't like in front of a canvas painting, then you'd probably find me on a horse. Did you, were there local stables or something that you got to ride around or? Well, I had horses growing up. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And then I, I started working under the table, which no, don't tell the department of. I know surgery. nothing. This um, is going out across. They probably the, you know, owe some taxes. <laughs> um, but anyway, I started working under the table when I was about 12 and I worked at a local motel and I got kind of tired of cleaning, uh, you know, trucker sheets. <laughs> and so I, I got a job and I already had horse, horse experience. I got a job at uh, a stables where civilians, civilians, non-horse people would come. The civvies, and, yeah. I know. And I trail, <laughs> yeah, they would do trail rides. So here I was, 12-year-old kid taking, you know, 20-somethings, 30-somethings out on, on trail rides. Did you have a fairly strict upbringing or the family element was for kind of strict and regimented because you, you, your father was in the military? <laughs> Early on. Um, and I, I would say my mom... My parents divorced um, when I was younger and my mom was, you know, the matriarch 
Mm -hmm. And she wrote, she usually ran a pretty tight ship. And my sister and I, knowing that sort of, you know, single mom is a lot of responsibility. My sister and I did pick up the slack, though we did give her a lot of guff. A lot of <laughs> you were living with your mother at that point? What's that? You were living with your mother at that point? Yes. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, were you, uh, you know, getting in trouble behind the scenes? <laughs> yeah, some. I think, I think most most kids go through that growing pain of trying to find who that who they are, and you know, you have to you you have to get go through those experiences and get out the other side. And yeah, and yeah. I do that to you know my husband's children. We we don't want to see them go through the same growing pains we did, but I feel like that is it's unavoidable. It's part of the course. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, it's a, you know, it's funny that like, you know, it's like, I think, you know, when you're really young and you think of your parents, even at their youngest ages in their twenties or thirties, something like that, like, oh my God, they're so old and they must, you know, they're, 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 they're your parents. They're supposed to have all the answers. And then you get to that age and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> how did like, you do it? <laughs> like, like I'm older now, right now <laughs> than my mother was when I graduated high school. And I think about that, man, wow. I thought she was so damn old. Where does that uh, leave me? I guess. So nearing the end of high school, where are you at in terms of like, where did you want to go after high school? Was it immediately to the service or was it, uh, you know, thinking college? What were you thinking at that point? Yeah, I was thinking the Colorado Institute of Art. Is that right? Yeah. And I had gotten accepted, but I began crunching the numbers. And uh, to be absolutely clear, we really didn't have a lot financially. We were yeah. always sort of the low, the low, low middle class. We lived in a single wide trailer, um, mm -hmm. an, an older one. My mom used to say that we may not have a lot, but it'll be clean and, and we will take care of it. And that was always the ideology. Yeah. When it came time for college though, there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough to go. Yeah. And I, yeah. I didn't want to do student loans because my mom had gone back to school and, um, had a student loan and the debt collectors were always calling us and it was kind of a nightmare. And then I, so my sister joined the military right out of high school and I went down to Lackland Air Force Base and when she graduated and that really inspired me. She was the first female A-10 crew chief in Air Force history and to see her sort of breaking through these glass ceilings and, and how showing so much success, I figured that was probably the right way for me to go to. So right after high school, you, you that was it? Even before I graduated. Even before actually. you graduated. Yeah. And was that, did, did your mom, uh, was she a supporter of that? Or, you know, and, and what about you? Were you still in contact with your father, still closer with your father? Yeah. Yes. I had to get, I had to get permission from both my parents. Oh, both. Wow. <laughs> Cause I was underage. Yeah. 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 As a minor. And both my parents were very, very supportive. Um, my dad being military and I come from a military family on both sides. So it goes back generation to generation or all the way to the revolutionary war on both Is sides. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Wow. That's you ever, like, remember Forrest Gump when yeah. uh, Lieutenant Dan, they're showing that little <laughs> sequence where somebody in the family dies. Um, luckily not every, we didn't have a member die in every war yeah. nearly actually, but um, yeah, that's kind of my family. Oh my gosh. So going from, from high school to military, was it uh, sort of a, a shock or were you kind of prepared for it or was it, uh, how was that? Right. I, when I enlisted, I, still had military um, family members. My uncles were still in the service and uh, my sister obviously was. And knowing knowing what my dad went through and what my family members went through, I think I was pretty well prepared. However, nothing prepares you when you go to basic training and they find all the military lineage that you have. They kind of they kind of get a little- Are they harder uh, on you? Yes. The expectations are a lot higher, I think. Yeah. Was there anything that your father told you right before you went off, like a little nugget of advice or something that, uh, you know, it's like, wow, you're really doing this. And this is what I, you know, give you that kind of nugget before you went off to it. Uh, I think everybody did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was all based on their own experiences. I, my dad, you know, keep your nose down. The best yeah. way to be yeah. is just one of the crowd. <laughs> it's like, especially in basic training, you don't want to be singled out. Mm -hmm. And my sister, she was a road guard. She was definitely singled out right away as a young woman, you you're obviously are, you're, you're a minority, a gender minority in the military. So it's kind of hard to hide, but yeah. um, it is also hard to hide when your uncle works on the base and comes and goes to church. With Was that tough? Did, did other people know it? Uh, yes. Yeah. 
And so you kind of felt, oh, yeah. I, I, the <laughs> advice thing too, like my dad was a Marine and you know, he, he would always tell me, you have two ears and one mouth, listen more than you speak. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, my grandfather, after my parents um, parted ways, my mother and my sister and I moved in with my grandfather um, and my grandma. And he was old school Navy, um, E9. And he used to talk about wall-to-wall uh, -wall counseling. That was the order of the day. And we used to have white glove inspections on Sundays. So if I could, if I could survive <laughs> living with my grandfather and white glove <laughs> inspections on Sundays, basic training was a breeze. <laughs> yep, yep. It kind of makes the rest of life a little easier once you've gone yeah, through that kind yeah. of upbringing. And uh, so you, basic training, how was that for you? Was it, uh, you know, was it tough? Was it, uh, did you find, you know, wow, being a woman that really are treating me differently or, you know, what was it like for you? Right. We were in an integrative flight, which meant that we were, when we were training, we were men and women, you know, marching together and doing drills together. But at night we had our own dorms right across right. from each other. And within, within our dorms, we had um, leadership positions and I was, I, they singled me out right away and made me the dorm chief, which is oh, like the highest, the yeah. highest you can be. And um, I was getting everybody out one morning. It was very, very rainy. The staircases were metal and concrete, super wet. Um, and I was running because we were always late. And I was the last one out of the dorm. I ran down and I slipped going down the stairs and I whacked my ankle like on oh. three stairs going down. And it immediately like poofed up. And then I had to go run two miles. <laughs> um, so I ran, I ran, <laughs> yeah, I ran two miles on an extremely sprained ankle. And then every night the, the drill sergeant's always like, does anybody have anything to report? And that's when you're supposed to be like, listen, I, I kind of messed up and hurt myself. I did not want to get recycled back to a different flight. I just wanted to graduate and get it over with. So I got a, I went to get an ACE bandage and I ACE bandaged my ankle and I ran every day on a, on a severely. Do you sprained. think ultimately that kind of in your own head proved to you that, uh, you know what, I can get through anything. It's like, you know, I, this is bad, but you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get through it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, but sadly another person dimed me out and they told the drill sergeant that my ankle was like black. Um, <laughs> so I ended up having to go get x-rays. It was just sprain. And the doc was like, listen, are you good? I'm like, I'm good. So, um, the drill sergeant's like, listen, you not telling me is tantamount to lying. So we're going to have to fire you as dorm chief. And I was like, cool, oh. fine. Uh, that's totally fine. Don't want it anyway. Was that, sort of, that was a relief. It was totally a relief. Yeah. Um, but then they made me guide on bearer. So I was the guy in the front carrying the flag. <laughs> that's and, my story. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. So basic training uh, ends and where, where do you uh, move on from there? I go to the defense information school at Fort Meade in Maryland. And mm -hmm. I attend the basic still photographers course followed by long world processing. Was that something you automatically going in sort of knew that you had an interest and wanted to go to directly or is it something you learned about when you were there? I had a guaranteed job going in the military. I, my contract said basic still photographer. Oh wow! I had a few choices. Like I said, my uncle worked down. I had like, you know, a little bit of nepotism going yeah. on. Um, I could be a graphics designer, a videographer, or a photographer. And as a young 17 year old, I said, whichever one opens up first. So photography it was, I got so, there and yeah. really regretted it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so well, at that it, point, were you shooting? Were you shooting up until that point? I'm mean, like, what was your, knowing that you wanted to be part of that, uh, you know, you know, division, was it uh, yeah. something that uh, like, I'm going to learn it or you, you had been <laughs> shooting up until that point and fell in love with it. <laughs> no. I had only had that one class in high school. <laughs> so like everybody else um, who had, who didn't know photography that was at the defense information school, they, we started out in the wet lab. We learned how to process film and slide film and take pictures. And, and then we were just on the cusp of learning digital. We were, you know, we didn't write, they had one. They were like, look, this is where we're going. And they showed this digital camera that was like this tall. Um, and it was just like, it was when this, the discs were like that big, remember? And if you dropped it, it would literally break. They were that sensitive. And oh it was God. like uh, a 215K card or something stupid. So the, yeah, that one picture nowadays. <laughs> anyway, I was not a great photographer. I'm not gonna lie. So what was like, what was it like the, when you, when you first went in there and uh, you know, was it, uh, were they 
they teach you the position? Did they, you know, do you get to work with the cameras? Or was someone like really kind of took you under the wing? What was it, what was the whole process like? Well, there were seasoned um, active duty military photographers who got assigned to DIMFO's Defense Information School to teach the next generation. And um, my two leaders, one was Army, one was Navy. Um, my Navy leader was Brian Aho, um, who many people in the industry may know. If you shoot Nikon, you may have actually interacted with Brian at some point. Um, which is, I love it. That's a, it's a small world. Um, but they taught me a lot, all the fundamentals. And I think it's just a lot of practice, fail, practice, fail, practice, fail, because nothing teaches you success better than failure. But you, you're not only just like picking practice, fail, you're picking, picking practice, fail in a military environment, which is <laughs> kind of about the much, you're talking about being thrown in the fire. That's like being thrown in two fires. <laughs> in our, right. Well, I would say that, yeah, the DIMF DIMFO is, is definitely more academic. You yeah. are in a, in a classroom, you go get your assignments and, and just like the, the collegiate setting, it was really mm -hmm. no different going to Syracuse, really university um, in that it was all very controlled. Yeah. Now, when I got to combat camera, that was a whole. So problem. when you when you first kind of go, go through it, uh, you, are you assigned, you, you, you kind of uh, go through a training process and then they assign you to go, you know, take what type of photographs? What are you doing at first? Yeah, they, they basically teach you ISO F stop shutter speed and how to do <laughs> manual exposures and what 18% gray means and composition, you know, keep the sun to your back, which is utter bullshit, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you have to learn the rules to break the rules. Exactly. And, um, that wouldn't happen for me until much later because I yeah. could not figure out the rules. I had a really hard time. What kind of equipment are you using at, at, at that time? I, I was doing Nikon. Mm -hmm. All night time. Mirrorless Nikon. cameras or? Oh gosh, no. We 35. were film, 35 yep. millimeter. Yep. yep. And what's that like for you? You know, in especially in the extremes, you know, with, you know, you probably around dust and sand and all kinds mm -hmm. of different stuff at certain points. So how is that like kind of working in that kind of environment? Well, you know, uh, again, in academia, it really wasn't that much of a challenge. Now later in, in combat camera, I got used right. to shooting with multiple cameras and never changing my lenses gotcha. to, to reduce the amount of um, like inundation. So what's the transition going from, uh, you know, the academia to the combat camera and how do you get to that point? Well, four years actually. Oh, gap. is that right? Oh yeah. Um, Cause I went to long world processing right after base, the basic still photographers course, and found, you know, learned about U2 uh, IR film and how to process it, how to duplicate it. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And then I found out that my first duty station was, oh, when I graduated, I, I said I graduated from a very small town. We were the largest graduating class of a whopping 80 students. <laughs> um, I, I told the military, please send me anywhere. I will go to BFE. I will go to Turkey, Korea. I will do remotes. I will go where nobody else wants to go. Except, Except for the Midwest. <laughs> now... <laughs> I was like, and I want to be a photographer. The military, when I graduated, said, congratulations, you've graduated. Here are your orders to off at Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh. And you will be at the United States Strategic Command. Bless your heart. You're going to have a top secret clearance working within a vault, within a vault, within a vault. And uh, you're not going to be able to see the light of day, nor will you be able to talk about your job. And you're going to be doing that because it's uh, a controlled job. You'll be doing that for four years. And is that sort of disheartening or are you like kind of like, no. <laughs> yeah, I cried. I oh, cried. And um, you had this window of opportunity to swap assignments with somebody else. So let's say another kid is from Nebraska and wants to go home. You could go like, do you want Nebraska? I'll take your Minot or wherever you want to go. Um, I don't want to go to Minot. Um, <laughs> nobody wanted off it naturally. So off it, it is. I went to off it. I went to night school. I joined the bowling league and I worked at the classics, which is the liquor store. Wow. I'm not going to confirm or deny whether I, I tasted the goods because I was <laughs> underage, but I will say this, there was a blessing. Somebody forgot to put a code in my assignment, which meant that instead of being there for four years, like I was supposed to, I got transferred to the UK, which was amazing. I was still doing intelligence, which seems like an oxymoron in the military intelligence but I was in the UK. And when I left, my dad gave me his old film camera. So I was shooting all I, all I could. And I met a local stable owner who needed somebody to help muck stalls and ride horses. So I was- the Best of all worlds suddenly. I, <laughs> I was like in, in hog heaven. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're out there and uh, when do you enter uh, combat training? 
Yes. I, I applied for combat camera. There was a position open. They don't open very often, but one came open in July of 2001. And I thought I had a snowball's chance in hell. And what I found out was the superintendent who used to be my supervisor back at Offutt Air Force Base was now the chief of the still photographer's flight at Com 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 Camera, excuse me. So like any self-serving person, I called and I groveled for the job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I got it. I got approved in July. My report later than date was January of 2002. Of course, a lot happened between the time I got assigned and the time I actually arrived, 9-11 mainly. Oh and yeah, and then by the time I got to Charleston, where the unit was, everyone was gone. And and how does one train for that type of photography? I mean, what I mean, what is the what do you go through to actually train for that? I mean, it's it's you know the the only thing you can equate it is like you know a war journalist or something like that. It's like you know, and it takes a certain type of person to be able to like run towards those type of situations. What how, how do they actually train you for something like that? Well, I think it's broke down into different segments. There, there are different facets of the combat photographer experience when it, in terms of military combat photographers, yeah. because you have the photographic part where you need to be really, really sharp, autonomous, and to be sort of like MacGyver that shit downrange if something breaks, because you've got to know your gear front and back, and then how to capture uh, caption and then use a satellite system out in the middle of nowhere, like ET, and then send, <laughs> send your stuff across the pond and hope that it arrives. Um, and then on the other part is the actual operating with other, other branches of service. Each branch has their own sort of dialogue and mm -hmm. uh, their own brethren and their own speak and having outsiders like I'm Air Force and we are the, um, softest most gentlest of the branches and therefore have a rep even though uh, i was a combat photographer yeah um so i had to learn how to speak marine and speak army because as combat photographers nine times out of ten we would be assigned to frontline units like that following them and that included close quarters combat tactical driving courses small arms train small arms training um maneuvering you name it how long is the the the, the training I think from the time I got there, the first three months were just certifying on photographic and satellite systems. And then um, I was also doing physical. Uh, we had phys physical um, training every day. Um, and that doesn't stop <laughs> the whole time you're there. That's a bar. That's like bar none. Um, and then the tactical portions of it, that happened always. We were always doing something um, in terms of like military combative stuff. Are you also like, going through arms training too, or is it just, yeah, you, know, yeah. yeah. you get, you get that and, you know, so you're, you're double timing it. <laughs> yeah. Because as, as the conflicts evolve, so do the tactics and you have to stay up on it. So, um, you know, my first six months were really, really aggressively being trained, um, on the fundamentals of being a combat photographer. Yeah. Um, and then from there, it's just staying up on it. <laughs> Between. Are you sort of given a mentor or someone that you get to talk to or someone that can, can kind of share it and, you know, really ask, you know, about the experiences and what to expect? And Yeah, absolutely. Um, everyone in our unit was um, really good about sharing experiences, if you could. I mean, you have to, you're, you're only as good as the person that really trains you and you yeah. don't want to lose anybody or feel responsible for that. So you pass it on as freely as you got it. What's the first assignment you get out of that? You combat or non-combat? No, once you finish your, 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 uh, well, the very first one you get, whether I'm sure it wasn't combat, the very first one it, you got. It wasn't. Yeah. And another airman in my unit had pitched a, going to a soccer tournament. It was like, our, like a, like a armed forces soccer tournament yep. in New Jersey or somewhere. And he thought he, he was going to do it. Then they were like, nah, give it to Pearsall. She means crazy. <laughs> I hate soccer. I hate sports. I don't know anything about it. But they were like, you need to do this. And you go by yourself. And I was like, oh, holy smokes. Um, so there I was photographing soccer. Did I get good pictures? Meh. <laughs> but I will say this. Uh, it was a good experience in learning yeah. how to just, it was a good confidence builder. After that, I went to South America, where I photographed a UN training um, between South, South and Central American armies. 
Um, and then after that, I went to Iraq. So no, I think that's, Korea, then Iraq, I guess. Uh, so I, this is probably a, a good place to kind of jump into some of your photos. But first of all, what was your very first combat experience in terms of, you know, photographing? I was asked to, um, I was, I had just been certified as an aerial combat photographer, which means I had to go to all the air crew training. And they said, okay, you're going to do these resupply missions from Germany to Baghdad and back. And you're going to drop equipment, photograph people dropping equipment, and then the wounded and bringing them back and showing what the, the medevacs look like. That was my first combat experience, which was sort of um, seeing the war from like 14,000 feet. Granted, we did land, but it was like a hot minute and I would I would not count that as the real deal. I, I later that year, so that was in June of 2003. And then later that year, I was assigned to ground forces operations uh, in Baghdad. So we're gonna jump into the very first picture that I have here. You've, you've graced me with a bunch of amazing pictures of you from you know throughout your career that we'll talk about. And let's jump into, obviously this is not you taking the picture, but uh, let's talk about this very first one. Right. Uh, yeah, so um, this was taken in 2007 by my husband. Um, my video at this partner, point, not your husband, or was yes, your yes, he was my husband at this point. And you guys met in uh, in the military. Yeah, oh, so we met right. we met at Combat Camera, and we got married between my <laughs> my deployment to uh, Lebanon and uh, no no my deployment to Africa and, and Iraq. And you find it it's probably third time. probably much easier to be married to someone that's actually understanding exactly what you're going through, and yeah, or, or is that uh, also kind of tough as well? It's a it's double edged. I think yeah. um, I think we definitely appreciate the struggles and understanding the need to go on the road and and the work. So, but you know, it's also hard when you're both, um, you know, trying to navigate the aftermath. And, you know, yeah. oftentimes in marriage, you have this flex where it's 60, 40, 50, 50, 70, 30, and somebody's got to be there. But when you're both 30, 30, and you're like, I need help, um, that can be a struggle. I think we found a really yeah. good place. Time, time is a good healer. And then we're going to go into that definitely much more, you know, especially, the, you know, what so happened? I guess, you? you know, the, the thing about this picture is it demonstrates, um, I went with the bare minimum most days. I used to carry a long rifle, like the infantryman. Yeah, um, yeah. Side of me, I used to carry wrong li long rifle like that, and my it probably annoyed you, right? It got in my way, and what I found <laughs> was, you know, my mission was to photograph them doing their combat operations and bringing the fight to the enemy. That wasn't my job, and no. you know, ultimately, when I when I started my training, I had a Vietnam veteran tell me um, that it if worst comes to worst, you're going to have that pucker factor and you know when, when you need to put your camera down and put your gun up. And I've been to on combat deployments prior to this, I've been in some firefights and it was my experience that when things did get bad enough that the photographer needed to get in the fight, there was enough guns to be had. Is the training so that at that point, you know, hopefully that instincts kick in or is it just, you know, your mind is going absolutely crazy and you're like, I'm not sure. You know, I can't imagine what, how, you know, servicemen do what they do. And, you know, thank you so much for your service. And it's, it's just, it, to me, it's, it's almost imaginable to, to do what they're doing. And uh, I'm thankful that there are people that do that, but what it's, what, what is it like the first couple of times you're out there? Well, they're the ones doing the tough job. I'm just, <laughs> uh, you were there too. You were there too. Uh, so. <laughs> no, not me. I mean, I was there. Yes. But I think the, the, the camera acts as a shield in many ways and, and in some ways like a blinder as well. I think it, it, not only focuses where you're going to be photographing, but it focuses you mentally. And I had to learn early on this, you know, repetition. You asked me, is it um, reactionary or responsive? Yeah. Um, you know, you you train like you fight. And when when you're training that redundantly, it becomes second nature. And and so, no, there wasn't a lot of fumbling. Granted. Combat's not sexy, like like Spielberg leads you to believe in in Saving Private Ryan or any of those other whiz bang movies. Um, there's a lot of fumbling and falling and shitting your pants. Um, but there's there's a certain amount of you know when you you as a photographers we're very aware of what's going around us until we actually bring that lens to us and we're hyper focused on what we're shooting. And mm -hmm. you're talking about hyper focusing on something when there's other things that you have to pay attention to. You know, so how do you how do you kind of 
cut that off. You know, like, oh, there's someone shooting over there, but I want to get that shot there. And it's like, how do you get to that point? Uh, you have no choice but to compartmentalize. You just don't. I mean, like from the moment I woke up on an on a operation day, accepting death as a part of what it's going to be and just focusing on what my job is. And um, how quickly or how long does it take to get that point where death is, you know, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's a, you can't gloss by that statement right there. <laughs> I struggled through that. My first deployment. Um, I think it really took my first deployment to really, to really accept that and be okay with it. Yeah. And this is you obviously uh, up getting ready for to go in the air. <laughs> yeah, well, we are we are in the air. This is um. Oh, taking, is the back open? <laughs> yeah, um, about to be. Yeah. So we are high uh, high altitude, low oxygen. It's called a halo flight. Oh and yeah. There, I'm leaning. I'm resting on some cargo that we're about to drop. Um, I can't remember where I am in this, but needless to say, uh, my 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 job was to to photograph the airdrop over some country so yeah well here's another here's another good view of the, the back end <laughs> uh, this, is, there, yeah. is there someone else uh, is there two photographers here or is this, you're giving this to one of the, the other this people is just there an, another operator on the the flight i'm actually in the back of a nate um what am i on a 130 no 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 i'm on a helicopter on this one um over off the horn of africa sorry I didn't quite catch that. Great, hey, Siri. Siri. But Siri, no one's talking to you. <laughs> it's a good place to take a little coffee. All right, let's go into the next job here. So at this point, uh, where are you in your career here and uh, taking this photo? And obviously now it's you're, you're paying attention to composition. Where, where do you find that suddenly like, all right, I'm actually starting to get control of my camera and now I'm really kind of looking for really kind of shots and put those shots together. My first year, I really was banging my head on a wall, trying to figure out the fundamentals of photography. For whatever reason, I really, really struggled. I could see things creatively, like compositionally, the light, I could see it in my mind's eye, how I wanted the picture to turn out. But being able to translate that to the technical aspect of photography and choose the right shutter and the right depth of field and the right lens selection, Ah, I, I was like, why am I doing this? Screw it. I'm going to nursing school. Um, I, I would say that this picture really was my aha moment. And I, I was finally getting the technical thing down. I was like, hell yeah. We landed in Baghdad. We were um, offloaded everything. And we were about to take off under the cover of darkness when a, a call came over the radio and they said there was a soldier that had been wounded by an improvised explosive device. And he had, um, it was a, a terrible hit and he needed to be on our flight or running the risk of waiting another 24 hours for the next flight. So the crew um, made the decision to wait for him, the crew and actually the entire flight of walking wounded. Um, and I knew like when the helicopter landed, I only had a split second to get a photo. So I ran back away from the plane. And what you see is on that top diagonal, that's the tail of the C-17 aircraft um, that I was air crewing on. And I ran out on the flight line and laid down on my belly on the tarmac. So the helicopter landed off to the left, the ambulance came and got him, they backed it up to the C-17 and I knew they were gonna be walking up. So um, this was the best of three frames I got that day. Oh, wow. How much, because I mean, obviously you're sort of, you're an employee for the government and you're shooting for them. Uh, how much freedom do you have in terms of what you're shooting or guidance or, you know, what they're telling you to shoot opposed to, so what is the, you know, what, what are the parameters there? Yeah, I would say that most of the operations that I went on, I had carte blanche for whatever I wanted to, to do. And it was my job to go find the stories, track them down, make the contacts, find the POCs and make the arrangements. There wasn't somebody being like, okay, your job today is to go photograph them handing out Happy Meals. Um, it didn't It didn't often work like that. There was on the rare occasion, there was a civil affairs um, mission that somebody needed pictures of a school opening or something, but most times full autonomy. And in terms of the, the, the pictures taken, do you own them or is it, the, you know, <laughs> no. They, oh, no, you, you can't have them or? We own them. 
as U.S. citizens, they're public domain. Right, if right. They, yeah, if they are deemed releasable, if they're not for official use only or or um, classified secret or above, then they're released to the public. And, you know, give it 50 years, those that are still F-O-U-O. -O, will get released. Only, they'll get released, yeah. Yeah. So do you have to write to use your own stuff or is it you're allowed to use your own stuff or how to... How I do have the right because they're public domain and they're my they're my images as much as they are yours. Now yeah. I have seen my pictures used on anti-war websites and pro-war websites, and somebody made a meme of one of my pictures and they said "freedom, motherfucker," and I was like, "Okay, great." Yeah, <laughs> kind of bite your tongue and uh, <laughs> move on. It's like uh, it's it's tough, you know, because I've talked to a bunch of journalists, obviously, and so you kind of sometimes wonder, it's like, you know, it's like, I know this picture is going to be used in the wrong way. And it, it's, what do you do about that? And some journalists obviously could not submit it, but it seems like is everything, is it, if you shoot it, it, they get it right. So there's no pulling any images out. They, they get the full role and, and there's no, there's no debate about it. Right. Right. Well, I mean, I am the first, I'm, I guess I'm the first line of, um, of the edit because I can't send, <coughs> excuse me, if I go on a six day operation and I, I capture 300, 400 frames a day, or probably more than that, if it's like real active combat, oh. I can't send all of those via satellite. This just would take too long. So, so at this point you're on, on digital? Yes. Yeah. So it's my job to be judicious about what's important and what people need to know and need to see and send the most essentials back to DC and really, and then the second line of um, filtering, if you will, is the Joint Combat Camera Center or, um, you know, who, whomever receives the imagery and then they distribute to the wire services. So do you have to, uh, once you submit it, uh, is it, you know, erase your card or that you have to get an okay to like, no, they might follow back up. No, we want, uh, you know, we need more of these photos. <laughs> I had, I had external hard drives that I carried with me, rugged yeah. laces, and um, I would back them up and then format my cards and go out go out i really didn't have enough time <laughs> to, to wait around for somebody like excuse me can you go back in your take is there anything before or after this frame I'm like nope <laughs> moving on you get what you get what is it like getting moments like this you know I, I i gave you this photo to share because i feel like it's a quiet moment and yeah and that's why i bring it up because it's these quiet moments that uh it's like a quiet moment there is so different than me sitting in my house watching TV. <laughs> right. And I think it's very nuanced because yeah. for those who are, are military or have military experience or family members like you um, who are military know that there's a certain sort of um, wall that is built up or barrier about this sequestering of emotions and yeah we were in the middle of the battle of Bakuba and there were casualties every day, whether, whether people were wounded or killed, it was an onslaught over and over every day. And it was very rare that there were times to have bereavement or, um, or mourning. And I think that's very quintessential military experience. And as an outsider, initially an outsider, a woman, an airman and a photographer uh, going into a unit like this, you have to build that rapport. And I never asked for just respect or demanded it. I always just proved myself um, to them. And that allowed me to be ingratiated into the team. And I think that this picture speaks volumes to that because just a couple few hours before this picture was taken, uh, a soldier from their particular squad had been shot and killed um, in the adjacent room. Is it hard to kind of... Eh you know, embed yourself in this? Are, are they accepting of you or do they feel your liability that, you know, how do they feel about you? Is it, you know, what's that kind of initial, you know, cause you're moving from group to group constantly. And it's not like you've been through, you know, a tour with them. You're, it seems like you're moving, you know, on different assignments. So it's not like they've built up this weeks and weeks of trust with you. And uh, eventually it came to that. I, I think, you know, initially when we we're first getting to know one another there is always skepticism as I mentioned before, Air Force is not necessarily known for their rugged, you know, <laughs> rugged traits. Um, so seeing a, an airman come into their sphere is very jarring. And then to see a female <laughs> come into an infantry unit was definitely uh, even more of an adaptation for them. But I think the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. And if you, as I did, um, 
just kind of put your nose to the grind and focus on the work and and show the results. I think everything that I ever provided for them was, my husband says it the best. Someone once told him that he was the ice cream, that soldiers who are on the front lines, we get to eat MREs and, and we get the worst of the worst. We don't get dessert. That that being the combat photographer, being able to provide pictures from these, the hard times and these um, hair raising moments is the ice cream. And do they get to get these photos from you? Is there, is there a way that they get to get these photos? Like these three gentlemen, if they wanted oh, that yeah. photo. Yeah, I'm still friends with these, oh, these three guys. Great. Yeah, um, it's this, the bond that you, that you create, it's one that, um, that can't be broken. Yeah. And a moment like this, this is just a natural moment, not staged. No, they're not, you didn't say just move a little further into the light. You know, it's just, you just saw it. It's like, oh, uh, you're, you're almost there. Yeah, photojournalism <laughs> ethics 101. You, you don't, can't do it. You don't, it. It goes here too. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't, yeah, you just don't. Yeah, um, you know, no, that's what I figured. But it's, you know, catching those moments, especially like this, you know, where, you know, look at that light on, you know, both. Yeah. So it was freezing cold. People don't know that the desert gets really cold in the winter. It does. And they had a, a jerry can and ammo an ammo box and they they rigged a, a coal stove and everyone was covered with soot they looked like you know virginia coal miners <laughs> so um i showed up there i'm like pristine clean fresh off the pop <laughs> and um, i'm like hey guys what's up and everybody looked to totally solemn and cross and i'm like what the hell happened and then they told me that um that their teammate had been killed and i was like oh, oh damn so I just took a step back yeah. and found found a good spot where the light was hitting everybody and, and just let things unfold. And um, they were beginning to chat a little bit. They started talking about their friend and then suddenly everything just went silent. And they, everyone seemed to just kind of exhale. And, and that was the moment that I took it. Yeah. I think what was special was they would take the soot off their face and put hand marks and feet marks all over the walls and just kind of kind of like cavemen, you know, prehistoric cavemen. And I, I'd like to think that the soldier was there with them, not only in spirit, but on the back wall. It was his handprint. Oh, that's beautiful. So how about a shot like this? Well, I, I shared this one because I think knowing where the action is going, if you see something happening over and over and over again, then you can get out in front of that action instead of constantly chasing it. And I think this was an example of, of knowing where we were going and what was likely to happen uh, and then using camera techniques to, to demonstrate the, the movement of it. How long does it take you to start getting into that anticipation mode where you now I've, I've experienced enough of this to now I can anticipate what might happen. Like, is that, you know, a couple months into it, a year into it? Maybe, I'm a, learning today. Learner. <laughs> Maybe I'm a slow learner, but I'm still <laughs> trying to get that right now. Um, no, I mean, I, I would say that uh, it took, you know, it takes practice, yeah. especially when you're under the austere conditions that you're operating under. Oh um, gosh, yeah. Not everyone's, a, not everything's a success. Um, and I, you know, I think a, a couple of years. <laughs> And it's just another one of those great quiet moments, you know. It's, it's just beautiful. I liked to focus on the humanity of the experience. I have guns and bullets and blood. I have yeah. that abundance, but it's not necessarily where I like to focus my portfolio or when people ask me of my work. I'm more proud of being able to um, lift the veil on the more common unexpected moments um the, the i think they're such important moments i mean you know it's like yes you know the the graphicness and you know it's like you know like blood cells on news and stuff like that and it's, it's 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 there's always a shock value to you know seeing you know gunfire and explosions and fire and stuff like that but the humanity of this in the moment in between those moments and bringing the you know these are real people these are real lives and you're capturing the importance of that in between the moment is what to me is how it holds the most gravity in these photos mm -hmm. and it's uh, you know that they become just beautiful. And it's like, you know, how can you not have emotion or empathy for these people seeing moments like this? And uh, I think they're, they're, they're the important moments for me that, that, and thank goodness that, you know, that you were there to capture them. I mean, just, you know, I mean, it, granted you are being given the 
some uh, elaborate sets and lighting and uh, and, and dust and, <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. Here. So I hope you get some good images. And this is definitely one of them. But uh, yeah, when you get handed a sandstorm, you just go to town. Yeah, right. Um, right. So this storm rolled into town. Um, it was a rain slash sandstorm, and we were in the middle of a firefight when. Um, They'd been aggressed. They, they, by we, I mean the infantry. Um, I was just there taking pictures. Um, if, if they're fi firing at everybody, you're part of the we, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't think they would. Anybody would discern. They were just aiming yeah. at people in uniform. Yeah. Um, now I, I knew, again, knowing that process to anticipate things, that I knew that the soldiers would go in. They would clear the lower floor. They would go to the second floor. They would go to the roof, clear the roof, and then go back down and move on to the next house. If not, they would crawl over from one roof to the next. Either way, when we were, we offloaded um, the tactical vehicle and making our way in the middle of the street with <laughs> small arms fire or whatever, um, I, I saw the clouds behind it. I saw the, the roof line and these two 50 cal bullet holes, three 50 cal bullet holes lined up next to this window with the, the glass blown out. Obviously we had been in a, we'd been here before. Um, and now we were right back here again. I thought there was some, some poetic irony there. Yeah. Um, and I knew that if I waited long enough, a soldier would come out and would look over the window and there would be this sort of like hero moment. The problem was, <laughs> I would have to leave my unit behind and be out in the middle of the street. Um, harken back to that pucker factor moment. Yeah, seriously. Uh, yeah, I'm like standing there with my camera to my face and you know, you hear the small arms going and you hear the soldiers doing their thing. And I'm just like, dude, come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And it feels like forever to, for them to clear this effing house. And finally I was about to give up and I'm like, no, I'm just gonna give it like, like 30 more seconds. But you were uh, able to you were able to anticipate a moment and get it, get it and uh, that's what's so important. I just uh, recently uh, talked to Pete Sousa, uh, uh, and uh, we were talking about one of his images, and he had gone to with Obama to um, where Mandela's jail cell, uh, Nelson Mandela, and uh, all the reporters are shooting right into the room uh, of the the jail cell, and uh, Pete Sousa goes up, he has a kind of you could see a light bulb go on his head, and you know the the handlers see him run out of the building, like where is he going? Like <laughs> what's he doing? He ran to the outside, knowing that. Obama was probably going to look out that window and he was going to get the same shot of, you know, of like, a, you know, Mandela looking out that window through the bars. And he got an incredible image of, you know, uh, President Obama looking out that jail cell, uh, that same image that, uh, you know, Mandela must have seen for years and years. And it's such a heavy, you know, incredible photo. But yeah. you had that. Now you're now you're anticipating stuff, and not only you know, you're working on your compositions and colors and, and stuff like that. And uh, do you feel at this point, uh, you know, Oh, because you didn't really study composition, really. You didn't go, you know, you, didn't, you weren't raised like, oh, I'm going to study yeah, the Abaddon's, the greats and all this stuff at this point. You're, you're, you're kind of learning this all on your own. Does, were you taught any kind of composition or is it now it's oh, yeah. all I mean, natural? This is all natural at this point. Well, I think, I think it can be taught to an extent. So I had some really great mentors. I'm, I don't want to diminish those yeah. who worked really hard to teach me, but I think you also have to account for your own vision and how you see things creatively. So um, I, I'm no Pete Sousa. You're really, really lucky you got to talk to him. I'm very I, trust me, I feel um, so really honored, but I'm just as honored talking to you, honestly. Pretty, yeah, pretty incredible. But yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm starting to find my voice visually. Yeah. But are they teaching composition or are you, the greats in that? Or are they actually going through that in, in your yeah. training? Oh, oh yeah. Fantastic. Time. A lot of studying. Yeah. yeah. And I think th this, I mean, just looking at this photo, you know, you see, you know, how much wind that those <laughs> helicopters throw it is it's unbelievable <laughs> yeah i was picking rocks out of my eyeballs for about a week after that <laughs> well, um but i knew the picture was going to be really tight yeah i mean the the sky was great this is in ethiopia um and the, the marines had dropped us out in the middle of nowhere um and i knew that the sky with the sky being blue <laughs> and then this clay that it was going to be this really cool gradation um so, you know, you slow your shutter speed down just a little bit so you can have some movement on the ro the rotors and, yep. and just wait for liftoff. I, I think I did a rapid fire frame release on this. Um, and I, I chose this one because there was like a little bit of dust, a lot of dust, no no visual. You can't see there. anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great moment. Beautiful. And this is just, uh, boy, I love seeing moments like this. <laughs>
Yeah, and again, I mean, hardware is great. I think if you can do, if you can exploit some really great techniques, hardware can be really visually interesting. But oh, I, yeah. for me, my heart song is in people and, and the relatability and the humanity. I think we as a society tend to put military in this untouchables category when that's just not the case. We take a slice of humanity, a slice of society, and put them in a uniform and call them military. That doesn't that doesn't take your um, your lifeblood away. Did you start out sort of interested in shooting the portraits, or was it sort of like it, it developed as you were shooting them? Because I know when I first start, started shooting photography, I was too scared to shoot people because I wasn't confident in my skills. You know, it's like I didn't want to go. Oh, one second, look at my camera. One second, look at my camera because it just it, it brought them out of it. So I shot a lot of you know architecture and different stuff like that. And once I got confident in my you know thing, I'm like, oh my god, I love shooting people. Was it how was it for you? Was it something that you always wanted to do, or you kind of from the very beginning? Mm. I think I had a. a there was something about telling other people's stories and, and, and people themselves. And I think portraits are, are just the cleanest way to get to the point of the, and to the heart of it. Yeah. And talk about an environmental portrait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This guy, um, we had just been in a firefight on the street and a bullet had ricocheted off the wall and hit him right in the groin. Um, and so he, he had turned around and I was right behind him when it happened. Um, I actually have the picture at that very moment. Oh my God. And, but he turned around and he's like, um, I'm not going to, I've already swore enough on this <laughs> episode. Sorry. It's, all right. it's not um, for kids. It's marked on YouTube, not safe for kids. So you can uh, do anything you but, want. <laughs> you know, he was sort of doubled over and yeah. um, I, I got down on my hands and knees and like pulled, pulled the, um, the, his pants had like a perfect, like, laceration and oh pull it back so I could see the injury to make sure he wasn't hit in a critical artery or something. Luckily it was um just a, a, a cut grazing. really clean cut. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> so I you know it was like I was tending to it, putting pressure on it and, and trying to get some yeah. bandaging on it. Well I had forgot that uh, a UK journalist had come and was like in the rear about a block down with a 200 mil lens or like a 400 mil lens photographing. So I guess like the next day, one, the headline of one of the UK newspapers was me on my hands and knees in front of a soldier with him bent over looking down at me. It didn't look good. <laughs> Connotation of that was like, wait a minute, no. <laughs> yeah, I just put women's lib back like two <laughs> Oh God. Anyway, that's the soldier. And he's yeah. smoking. he's smoking because his balls did not get shot off. <laughs> relieved. <laughs> Very relieved. Very relieved. <laughs> and I think this this image too is very reflective of the very brief moments of um a bereavement and connectivity. Uh this rarely, rarely happens. And I think the the trust factor that goes into these soldiers allowing themselves to be photographed vulnerable. Um, yeah. It, it's, it, what, what is that like for you though? I mean, are, it, does it get to a point where they kind of just, you're not even there, you're flying the wall and they are, are they at certain moments like, you know, get that damn camera out of here. Uh, what, what's um, it like for you? And, and, and how are you playing that? Because you have to be so sensitive to the moments and, and, and also want to capture the moments. That's a, that was a very, fine line to walk and I always struggled with that and so yes if I was doing it right they would forget I was there and um because I I had been with them so much that I was just another another Joe and you know they're Joe, Joe Schmo in the unit um and I've been told and I've been told to f off before too um it just so happened that a friend of mine had been shot and he was dying and I had a really hard time, a real struggle in that moment to decide whether I was going to be a combat photographer, like the military wanted me to be, or if I was going to be Stacy Purisall, his friend, that's a tough place to be. How many times and, a day do you question, like, am I, can I continue doing this or do I want to do this? Is it something, is it a constant battle or is it what, how is, how is that going on in your head? That struggle? Um, the shoulda, woulda, coulda, pain is still, it still exists for me. Um, I felt like my moral compass had just really gone off track because I put the camera to my face. I took a couple of frames and the soldiers were screaming at me. Um, and you know, it's hard to be the outsider because you're suddenly the scapegoat. Um, and I had 
scapegoated to myself too. I blame a lot of myself and I carry that burden even today. I, I have managed to accept that there are things that I cannot change and um, I, I won't make those same mistakes twice. Yeah. Is it something you constantly just have to turn off while you're there and like, all right, you know, I don't, that empathy thing of, you know, shooting, you know, this moment, I'm going to, I'm going to turn that off and I have to yeah. become a, you know, a vampire and, uh, and absorb this and uh, for, for forget uh, certain things. It's like, cause I mean, it's every photograph it, it could be a lifetime of, you know, pain or torment, you know, to you and them. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it, you, you, it takes, like I said, it takes a special person to be able to go and do this. And, you know, uh, it's, it's one of those uneasy things that you, you probably, it, it, it stays with you the rest of your life and there's no way that it can. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I photographed soldiers who died while I was taking their picture. Um, I've so photographed soldiers who have been revived while I was taking photos. Um, but I think you have to be all in. But I, I, I mean, yeah. You constantly have that battle, but it's also important to, to document these because how will these, you ever these remembrances we, we can't forget these moments no i mean how will you ever know not to not to repeat history if you don't have a visual archive of it yeah. like, you know i think i respect all all everyone um and it's because i respect them that i knew i had to keep going and not only obviously from this picture is it just about the, the troops but it's all the other people you know and uh Moments. Sure. I, I think what I found quickly was as, as one of the only women <laughs> that were like, you know, nine times out of 10, I would be the only woman on operations and I would carry around an extra, the extra um, responsibility of checking women for bombs, um, you know, and, and also being the mediator in, in some instances, because when, when the locals realized I was a woman, they would come to me with women related issues. Like, Hey, my husband was detained this morning for launching a mortar round. I'm not an enemy fighter. My husband's a jerk, but now I rely on my husband to support our seven kids. What am I supposed to do? Oh, um, it's yeah. I mean, it was, um, very complex, yeah. so a lot more than I could have ever dreamed of. And this moment here, she um, had a family to kids to care for. Her husband had, this is that story. This is that, husband, I figured, I, I just I wanted to. You know, no, connect her, the dots. her husband had been detained for launching mortar rounds at US Army soldiers. And she doesn't know how long he, he'll be gone. And she relies on him to buy the groceries. I mean, that's the culture, it's yeah. a patriarchal society. And suddenly when the male, when the man is not there to provide for them, the women and the children are basically ousted from their homes. They are going hungry and she is beyond, she is past, she is past the uh, coping point. Yeah. And it's just, you know, just sort of an everyday moment when you're out there. <laughs> Uh, technically, yes. Yeah. You know, when you see errant cars that are left sort of abandoned, oftentimes there are vehicle borne IEDs and you could do a couple of things. You could <clears throat> finally get to use your grenade launcher on your, um, on your rifle, uh, or you light it on fire with a little bit of gasoline. So oh. blow it up. That's I mean, just a beautiful shot. Uh, okay, so we had a lot of foreign fighters coming into country and um, fi foreign fighters from Syria and other places far afield. And um, this is an Iraqi army uh, commander who was interrogating a number of foreign fighters and be like, why are you here? <laughs> like, he, he was trying to explain to this guy, he's like, listen, we've got enough to deal with. We don't need you to add fuel to the fire. Well, it turns out this and in this detainee um, is the fledgling ISIS. So, and you have an incredible composition here of you know seeing his hands bound and the you know the light of him is like how much are you moving like is this just like what you just immediately see it or are you moving around and waiting and for a moment right. or it's like. I kind of joked, you know, when, when I talked about the fundamentals when I was in school and they're like, put the sun to your back and only photograph that way. And I'm like, I never do. If you look at, if you look at my pictures, I use a lot of very short lighting. It's all very shadow heavy. Um, I think there is light and shadow for every mood. And, and 
while it takes light to create an image, I think it takes a lot of shadow to create dimension and drama and feeling. Yeah, and I think yeah, when yeah. used when used appropriately, it can really convey a feeling. I had the challenge that I couldn't show the detainee's face. So obviously I was working in a very small, um, a small space. The door to the left, I had walked in and the light was way too overwhelming. And I'm like, this just doesn't feel right. Let me let me squeeze behind the detainee. So I had a, I had my um, wider lens on and I like backed up into a corner right, right behind him. And the Colonel, thank God he, he was so concentrating because it was such a small room that I could have been a real distraction. <laughs> it's like, what is she doing? Yeah. But I mean, it, it shows exactly what it takes to get an amazing shot like this. And you know, the parameters that you had to shoot it where you couldn't show a face, but showing those bound hands i think has a lot more gravity than to showing his face because it, it just it's in yeah it, it's a powerful picture Thank you. and we're catching a bullet ejecting from a gun so i mean just like that, <laughs> using that fast shutter speed and it's it's like uh yeah using you know the tools that you have and, and do you feel like you've at this point sort of mastered your camera the iso the shutter speed and you, you know the camera isn't controlling you anymore you're controlling it yeah, I mean, I was like aperture priority. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, for sure. And I think, you know, with the amount of dust and stuff like that, I, I tend to fo photograph wide open. Yep. If, if my aperture is 2.8, it's 2.8. Um, or if my am limited to four, then I go four. I don't like to be at four. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I was up close and personal with all the action most times. So I was really photographing mainly with a 24 to 70. I had a 12 to 24 I would take out on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those are have inherently have native depth of field. So I really didn't have to worry about whether I was going to get this or that. Um, right. So my, my concentration was on stopping action or showing action and how I was going to compose to make that work. And another one composition was this, uh, what did, was this in camera? Or did you, uh, you know, have the in camera? The, yeah. yeah. He, I was like right up in his face. I'm like, hey. <laughs> cause I mean, a lot of people might go in post like, Oh no, if I crop it here, this is pretty awesome. But no, you, you thought about this right, right on the spot. No, I, I would say 99.9% .9 of my work is cropped in camera. Yeah. I will make some really minute, like if I have, if, if my horizon line is a little wompy yep. or, or something like that, I might make a minor change, but I try to um, crop as I see it. Yeah. I, I, this is, I, I keep always coming back to this photo because it just, it, this is one of your photos that I, I don't know, on so many levels just really kind of resonates with me. And uh, you know, I'd love to hear you know, the story behind it. We had been out on operation for two days. Uh, it was, we were two days in on a six day op. Now, within the first the first day of that op, um, an improvised explosive device had blown an MRAP, which is a, a big sort of like tank-like troop carrier, up up so far that the axle had got blown into um, a power line and was dangling off a power oh line. My God. Needless to say, things did not go to plan, and we did not get as far into the op as we wanted. Everyone was really tired, and we decided to take a house and take some rest. And by take a house, I mean, we went into some private civilian's house uh, with a family and said, you need to go to the back room. We're going to rest in here in your living room. Uh, you know, obviously I, I, I struggled with that because yeah, seeing these yeah. young children and the mom and feeling, you know, feeling like we, we could potentially be putting them in harm's way. As you can see, there's cardboard in the windows already which means that these windows have either been blown out or shot out already. Um, when we walked in, there's always had to be somebody standing watch. And these two were thick as thieves, these two soldiers. And the dude's like, you got first watch. And we looked up and because we had ushered the, the mom and the children to the back room, there was no time to turn the TV off or the lights off, it just left. And so when we walked in, there was cartoons on the TV playing, obviously it was in Arabic, but this kid, and may I remind you, he may be infantry, but he's a kid, he's 18 years old, oh. sits, down, sits down in this plastic chair, which can barely hold the weight of his armor, his gun and his own body weight. It's like the, the chair starts to buckle a little bit and I'm waiting for it to crack, but it doesn't. And he settles in and his friend just goes right to, to standing watch while he watches cartoons. Mm. Anyway, that was a very long story, but 
That's no, it's that. It, it, no, that was a great story. <laughs> this is the image that was made into a meme. So he said, "Knock, knock. Uh, who is it? Freedom, MF." <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I could see that this is definitely being very meme worthy. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. again, this this comes down to anticipation. Right, uh, right. The action and getting out in front of it. Yeah, I mean, so you you knew that they were gonna try and knock that door down and this yeah. is just uh you know once again doing what you do in terms of that light and darkness and shadow and uh i think that's uh one of the beauties and you know of your work and and thank you and the, you know obviously making it so dramatic and then that blue light coming in and uh yeah so i think there's also something to be said about color language and and feeling and what colors can can be really evocative and I think that this is this is proof that color can enhance a mood and, and explain a, a person's feeling in that moment. And I think, it, again, a lot of my work is so heavily shadowed for so many reasons, but um, this picture was really representative of what I, I started to do six weeks into my last deployment. I started taking pictures of every soldier either before or during um, operations in the likelihood in the event, hopefully an event that they were um, killed. And because I had learned the hard way that some of those soldiers I operated with had been killed and I had not photographed them. And I felt like a responsibility to do that for the families and for myself. And so I have this accumulation of portraits of soldiers um, before operation. So um, this one ended up in the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. It's it's an important an important archive to to have, and I, I'm sure the families are so thankful that you did that. And this just a normal, you know, hey, how'd you get up there? Kind of. <laughs> Which stairs did you use? Because it wasn't these. <laughs> Right. No, I think he's, <laughs> he actually scaled the the staircase, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, there, there is like um, a lot of insurmountable obstacles, but but visually, is a lot really really interesting. To so play it's being life. in such intense situations a, a lot of the day, and you know, fearing for your lives, losing friends. Like, what are those moments of lightness and and what's the humor like because i mean you you have to like you have to laugh otherwise you're just going to feel like well so when they're actually how silly or how like what are those moments like when they actually get to kind of laugh we're always laughing <laughs> always and at the most inappropriate times <laughs> yeah people think it's really dark but the choices is the, yeah <laughs> it is the only way that you can mentally get through that yeah um yeah always laughing and you know the the thing is like my battle buddy Katie, she and I still um, share some really dark jokes, and people from the outside who have weren't there with us might be like, "Ooh, that that's rough." I, I wasn't even like, in there. Hey, people me. around me with my family look at, <laughs> look at us that way. <laughs> We're a very dark, sarcastic, sarcastic family. <laughs> oh, for sure. Oh, this um, is, yeah. So this is in the back of a troop carrier. Uh, obviously, if you're um, you're limited in some cases to a certain space and, and you know you have to make do with what you got but this is um just about to the they pop smoke so the cover concealment and we could go into this local tree grove to um bring the fight to the enemy and there you are Ta -da! <laughs> so this so let's talk, you, you know, the next set of pictures are sort of going into your portrait work, but let's let's kind of talk about your, you know, your, obviously throughout, uh, you, you were injured twice, not, not yes. once, but twice. And, uh, you know, the first time was that, uh, how, how serious was the first time that you got injured? And how do you get to the point like, well, I'm going back out there? Um, I was hit by a roadside bomb and I sustained a cervical tra spine trauma and traumatic brain injury. The traumatic brain injury, I mean, I also ruptured my right ear drum. It was blown out. Um, I, we were out on operation for several hours before I actually got medical intervention. And by the time I went back to the Air Force tent to see the doctor, let me remind you, this is 2003. The Air Force felt like other airmen were seeing the war between 500 and 14,000 feet. 
And to have a young airman come in covered in blast soot and ear, blood coming out the ear was a little mind boggling. <laughs> so the doctor's like, what happened to you? And so I had to explain. Um, and then the doctor was like, well, here's some Motrin. It looks like you've got whiplash. I think you're good. I'm like, okay, cool. My neck really hurts. Um, they're like, you're good. I, I came home and I fell down. I don't know how or why I did, but vertigo began to set in. The doctors initially thought it was because I had blown my eardrum out and, and I had developed some temporary vertigo. Turns out years later, we'd find out it was traumatic brain injury. But nonetheless, I was like, I'm cool. I was actually out on operation the next day after I was blown up. And um, I think the ideology is that if you have your eyes and you know, somewhat of your ears and you've got your limbs and you're, you've got a pulse, just get the back back to work, rub some dirt on it, get back to work, don't talk about it, just move on. And I did. I was taken off of flight status when, um, when they found I had vertigo. Devastating for me because that was a career recessing, not moving forward. So I gave it the time they wanted me to do, do rehab. I went to Syracuse University, which was a great break. It was 10 months of just academia and getting my mind right because I was suffering from a little bit of post-traumatic stress disorder at the time. And then I volunteered to go back to combat camera. In order to get back on flying status, this, the flight surgeon was like, are you good? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I really wasn't good. Um, so I was lying to myself and, and lying to everyone else just so I could do my work. You I'm must have, like, I one can only imagine, you know, you know, the fear of IEDs and stuff like that is a constant, you know, you just, every round, every corner, you just don't know. And then you experience it. And how do you kind of next day go, oh, I'm going back out there and I've experienced it, but I'm going to, is it just totally kind of ignore it? Are you hiding from it? Is like, you've turned off something. And it's like, it's like, how do you like, <laughs> Um, I think initially I was, still a little numb numb to it it wasn't until like months later when I came home from Iraq that first time that things really started to bother me like I couldn't I couldn't go to this festival and have a kid pop a balloon behind me without nearly peeing my pants um things had things had begun to change there was a paradigm shift in my life but not only not only in as a, my focus as a human being but but a photographer too my vision's my vision of the world began to change and it was definitely colored and filtered by my, my own experiences to that point. And I think it only made me, it only improved my ability to see what others were going through and to articulate that photographically as best as I could. Am I the best photographer? No, but I did the best that I could yeah. um, with, with the feelings and the emotions I had and how I was going to articulate that. So how much time is it between the, that first incident and the second one? Uh, so that was that was in February of 2004. And then I was blown up again in um, March 2007. And then I was injured during um, during an ambush. And that's what ended my career. And the, yeah, as you said, this was the, the career ending one. So you, you uh, how much time did you spend uh, recovering from that one in the hospital? Um, well, I spent some time in the hospital in country. I was there for like a week and then they wanted to send me to Germany. I said, hell no. So they sent me back to Charleston and then I did outpatient recovery for 18 months. How quickly do you know that it was, did you realize it was going to be a career ending injury immediately or? Yes. Yeah. And, and what kind of, how did that play with you? Cause obviously, you know, family tradition, you know, all this, you, that's all you've ever done since leaving, you know, even before ending high school, what was it like for you at that moment? I was in denial. I, I was in incredible denial. I, I, I prolonged the inevitable for 18 months. Let's be real. Um, because I wasn't ready. I felt like I could come back from it, but you know, everybody else, everybody else seemed to know it, but me, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. but you know, I think Hindsight is always 2020, but I think the journey that I had in combat and the journey that I had during my recovery was only the preamble I needed to launch me into what my next mission in life was going to be. And that was the Veterans Portrait Project. So how did you, uh, what was that little internal journey between, you know, you know, the hospital bed to, you know, getting to that? How did you go, wait, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. Like what? 
what got you that point to say this is the next thing I'm going to do and what was it it was a, it was a culmination of things first of all I felt completely alienated by the veteran community because I was not <laughs> I was not a man um, and I was a young woman I also um, got really really frustrated with um, how women were marginalized at the at the VA and how I constantly had to go above and beyond to get the same treatment as my male peers. But I think moreover, how we as a society um, view the veteran community solely as male, everything that's depicted in media, movies, um, literature is from the male voice. And therefore, when somebody says the word veteran, it's not my face that really comes to mind. Um, I, every time I went to the VA, I felt like guys were staring at me, undressing me with their eyes. It was just, just it was a really dark, disgusting place for me. And I began yeah. to project that darkness on everybody else. And it really, really skewed me in an awful direction I didn't want to go. Plus the doctors were telling me all the things I couldn't do, that I couldn't do photography anymore. I couldn't stand for long periods of time. And I felt like I, I was making plans. Let's just say that I was making plans. Um, one day a, a World War II veteran, an elderly guy was staring at me, he came and sat next to me and he just like was really driving me nuts. I finally was gonna give him a piece of my mind and said I started a conversation with him. And he was a volunteer at the VA and he was a, a Normandy survivor, a concentration camp liberator, an American hero. And I was about to be the completest, stupidest person ever. But what I realized in that moment was, we don't know who we're sitting next to. We don't know who we're talking to. And I could be the one to help lift the veil on the veteran community that we are young and old, male, female, non-binary, from all walks of life, from every demographic, religion, um, that we are not pigeonholed into one particular thing and that we all have a unique story and that we have all contributed to the military story, whether we served in combat or not. So suddenly I made this deal with a public affairs officer by the name of Michael Dukes. And I started bringing my camera to my doctor's appointments and taking portraits while I was waiting. And then I started taking more and more portraits and not needing my doctor's appointments. I set a crazy goal that I would photograph veterans in every state thinking that would be a lifetime. And um, that's where it all started. So let's let's uh, kind of jump into some of these. And here's the first image that you had sent over to me. And uh, is this at the very beginning, or where where at this point are, are you in that uh, travel? Yeah. Um, okay. So I started the Veterans Portrait Project in 2008. It was just local, Charleston only for that first year. And then I started thinking, okay, I'm going to do some paid assignments. Suddenly, I was taking pictures again, and I I was like, screw the doctors. I'm going to do what I want to do. So I was taking pictures again, taking on commercial assignments and then squirreling away money so that I could drive to other um, venues and take pictures in another state. So I was going to Georgia and North Carolina. On your own dime, yep. On my own dime, that's yeah. correct. Um, so fast forward, 2008, 2009, 10, 11, I had an exhibition in Montclair, New Jersey. And I went up there and it was some of my veterans portraits up there. I I was like, like a fish out of water. First of all, um, I didn't know why I was chosen to be part of this show. Was, uh, things always happen to me like this. I feel really, really blessed and lucky. Um, and suddenly I found myself standing next to somebody who's relatively incognito, like a 40, 50 something kind of guy, smartly dressed. And he's like, tell me about this. And I'm like, well, let me tell you. And so I give my stop, stop story about the Veterans Portrait Project and like, you know, prejudice and, and ideology and anyway he was really really inspired by it suddenly like a couple of days later I get back home to Charleston South Carolina I get a phone call from Keener Gill a Marine Corps vet who who works at USAA and he's like we want to we want to hear your story and I was like really why <laughs> <laughs> me <laughs> fly down to Tampa we want to meet you on the campus at Tampa I'm like sweet so on my own dime, I fly to Tampa and I find myself in front of a bunch of USAA executives telling them about my combat experience in the Veterans Portrait Project. And I was like, listen, my goal, you know, I, I, I was suicidal. I didn't think I had anything left to give. And suddenly I realized that, that I had this new mission 
And I'm like, however long it takes, you know, the goal is to have it be a lifetime so I can keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, but I want to photograph in every state. And then he, he leans back and he's like, well, I don't think we can get you to every state, but we can at least get you where USAA has representation. And I was like, wait, is that why I'm here? I didn't even know. I didn't know. Oh my gosh. Um, I was so naive. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that I was pitching them. I have the a feeling that probably played I didn't in your favor. It. I have a feeling that probably played in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they brought me, they, they are one of the key sponsors for American Legion conventions and BFW conventions. And so um, myself and my veterans portrait project colleagues uh, helped me set up the studio and we were photographing like anywhere between 60 and 80 and 100 veterans a day. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and incredible stories. Where are you in your journey of like, you know, because I, obviously it's, it's, it, it's one that uh, mental health on this is, is, you know, it will be with you for the rest of your day, but where are you in terms of, you know, uh, dealing with your own, you know, uh, mental, you know, issues from coming back from the war and what you saw, are you in denial still? Have you accepted it yet? Are you kind of really on a, road to recovery and, 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 and talking about it or is it still internalized where where are you at that point in your life mm -hmm. well post-traumatic stress is not something that is curable it is no that's why i said it's going to be the right. rest of your life but For, it's just something that you have to learn to incorporate into your new normal and for me where i'm at right now is um, you know, every morning I make a conscious decision to be present, to be mindful, to be in the moment and to not let it, to not succumb to it. Yeah. There are days that are harder than others to, to live by that mantra. No, and, I, and more so like, I, I know that you, you've actually, you know, you're very uh, outspoken about mental health issues now, especially with soldiers and that, but I'm talking even coming back it, when you first start shooting these portraits, are you still in, I, you know, I'm fine. I just have some, you know, I just got to deal with it myself or are no. you actually seeking help and getting help at this point and where how did yeah. you get to that point because so many come back and they try and hide it from everyone and they you know they don't want to talk about it they don't want to you know deal with it or they don't know that it's actually what they're suffering from mm -hmm. so and, you know i think it's very important to kind of identify that in your journey because a lot of people don't get to do that and and you did yeah i you know the very early on it was a challenge because any little thing would set me off. Um, the stress, the anxiety. Um, I didn't know portrait lighting. I had a small class with Joe McNally in my military career. <laughs> so um, I was all thumbs trying to navigate this, this new sphere of my life to redefine who I was photographically and to give myself some semblance of an identity because everything, everything from my time in the military had basically been stripped from me. And that's a tough place to be. And then on top of that, um, you know, coping with all that is post-traumatic stress, um, and then and then the physical pain on top of that. Yeah. So, you know, it was a it was a journey. It was definitely catharsis, though, because with every veteran that I met, they were dealing with their own baggage and seeing that they could get through a lifetime of it. Like this particular veteran that's on the screen now was. Uh, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So if if he's there and he's still smiling, for God's sake, what am I whining about? <laughs> <laughs> so when you're shooting these portraits, at this point, what is it you're exactly trying to capture? And what is it you want to, you know, the, what was the basics for you saying, I have to shoot these and this is why? I think often history books tend to gloss over military campaigns um, and look at them by numbers. And the military is more than that. It is about women like Mickey here in this picture um, who joined the Marines during Korea with her best friend uh, and, and broke some glass ceilings. And you know, while the guys were getting issued their uniforms, she was issued a pattern and was expected to sew her own. You know, She made headway in the military for women like me to come after her. Um, so each and every thread is so important to make up the very fiber of the military. And if I could convey that through the moxie of someone like Mickey, then 
then it was so much more important. Yeah, it's, um, it's, I mean, look at these photos and you know, it's just like, uh, <laughs> and this moment, right? It, 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 where are you shooting here? This is the National Veterans Memorial and Museum in Columbus, Ohio. It was Senator John Glenn's baby. Oh. Uh, and you're saying, and when you're shooting here, how many, this is this another one of those 100 a day or something like that? No, I, okay, so I, I tend to do things um, like full speed. Uh, <laughs> my, a lot of people say I don't have an off button. And um, I was burning myself out because physically, while I was trying to prove something to myself, like I, I had already snubbed, you know, the doctors about them telling me what I couldn't do. Um, and I had, and I had proven that, but I hadn't come to terms with myself yet. And it took me having a grand mal seizure to realize that I couldn't go all out anymore. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to pause on this picture because obviously we're going to introduce someone that's uh, important to your life here. Uh, that, that beautiful little face right there. And he was already a celebrity when you got him. Yes. Um, and, uh, I didn't even realize it, uh, you know, when we spoke last, you know, and uh, when I was getting ready for this one, uh, I was just looking, looking up stuff and uh, I realized, wow, he was on a talk show and mm -hmm. he came from, what was it? Good Morning America? Today Show. Today Show. It was the Today yeah. Show. Today and show. Uh, and I didn't really watch Today Show that much, but I did see him on it and I did see you receive him on it. And it was I remember that has stuck with me to this day, remembering that and how beautiful it was. And what was that like for you? And you know what? I'm going to show a clip of that. Oh. <laughs> Do you have, when was the last time you saw a clip of that? Uh, three years ago <laughs> um, when we were assigned to each other. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, you know, I think I spent a lot of time keeping people out away from um, knowing what was really going on. Because if you were to look at me, I look really able-bodied and that's fine. Um, I have my challenges, but I, I never wanted to be coddled or held back um, because what other people thought was best for me. And um, I spent a lot, a lot of effort making people think I was doing better than I really was. So to finally submit to um, who I am for real, for real. And to begin to take that barrier down brick by brick, it really took somebody special. And that was Charlie, my service mm. dog. Well, sometimes it's a lot more difficult to deal with the, the scars that are on the inside because you, you, people tell you you're injured, but you can't see it. You can't really feel it. It's, it's, it's something that you, you have to, like, I have dyslexia and for many, many years, like, Oh, he's smart, but he's just, uh, he's being lazy or he's being this, that, and the other. And, uh, it got to the point it was like well i go wow they're telling me i have something in my brain that makes me see or do something differently and it was like how do i deal with that and it's just you know you have to deal with it yourself and for you that's what you were doing and how did charlie change and change you and how was that what what did he give you or change your life in a way that uh you know, I don't um, know. charlie really gave me freedom to be my real self and to be able to acknowledge that part of me is necessary to be the whole of me. And I think he lets me have a life without fear because there's nothing scarier than, um, than wondering when you're going to fall down and have a seizure and be by yourself. And my husband, again, I don't like to be coddled. So um, my husband was spending so much more effort in, in trying to keep me safe. And I wanted my husband to be my husband, not my caregiver. Um, so Charlie is so much, he's my photo assistant, my caregiver, my post-traumatic stress uh, support dog, my mobility dog, my, he's my man. Oh, so normally I would put this into a, Stacey, thank you. We're going to throw it right here. Oh boy. <laughs> we're going to show this, but I'm going to go straight to where Charlie is. There he is, a puppy. You, this is before you got him, right? Yep. He's so cute. <laughs> so you had been watching Charlie even before yep. you got him. Just like everybody else, I had been watching the Today Show and, and watched him come out, and uh, it was, yeah. So at this point, you don't even know you're getting Charlie. No, no. <laughs> and how long is it between you watching this on on the Today Show and you getting Charlie? A month, two months? 
Um, no. So he, he came in down the carpet that day. Um, now well, I, I meant to, when you saw you saw him as because this he he was a oh, you saw him as a puppy right you it was yeah. a, he was on the Today Show you're watching him as a puppy you had seen him prior to him mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. given to you yeah Olivia Poff the um, the trainer standing next to me yeah she was she trained him for 18 months ah uh, okay um, yeah and I had no idea that I was even in the the short running for a service <laughs> dog because I had applied for a dog um, here he is there he is. <laughs> <laughs> That's so oh. um i had applied for a service dog and then charlie was really um came down the red carpet as a puppy on the today show i had no idea that it was going to take eight months eight months 18 months on a wait list to get a service dog wow. and that charlie would end up being him so i really hit the jackpot i don't know why i'm so lucky but i really really am. I, I understand that and that, you know I, it's it's a life-changing thing and, and pets alone are are, are part of the family and stuff like that but a, a pet that you can rely on that's you know your partner you know and, and helps you is is another it's a whole nother level and uh so i'm sure charlie's in there with you now right yeah actually it's um dinner time so he went downstairs <laughs> yeah that he's not important anymore <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump back into some of your portraits here uh let me just uh, bring this back up all right let's go into this one and now you're going into like up to this point, were you shooting any black and whites? And was it an interest to do black and whites? And suddenly now you're going into like I see these portraits that are now black and white. So from the very beginning, I made the decision creatively to have the Veterans Portrait Project be black and white. I knew that it was going to take me a long span of time. Um, so that I didn't want there to be a disparaging difference between the, the image I took, the first image I took in 2008 to the last image I take whenever that is. Um, and I think with black and white, it cuts right to the point. It, there's no distraction with what they're wearing or anything. It's just real clean. So um, all of the 8,500 portraits that I have in my collection are black and white. Are you continuing to shoot this or is this yeah. an ongoing thing? Yeah. And uh, how do you see a foreseeing end or is you just going to do it as long as you can? Well, I haven't I, even I, decided. Uh, I haven't really decided. <laughs> I, I, I photographed, um, I finally got all 50 states, Veterans Day 20, 20, 2019. And um, I, I made it a point to have my last state be Nebraska because that was my first duty station. Oh, that's great. I'm sure it's every me. single one of these has a story. And, uh, you know, if, if there's one here that you, you would like to, as I'm going through them, kind of uh, stop on, please. Well, this is know. that badass Marine Mickey I was talking about. She's pretty awesome. I'll go back to her for a second. And, and obviously she's holding a picture of herself back in. And yeah, just, back in the day. Um, did you inform them to bring anything like that or did she just bring it on her own or? So, yeah, I mean, I, I created a sort of what to expect Mm -hmm. kind of sheet that I send all veterans ahead of time. And it says, you know, come as you are, who do you, who are you now? Um, bring a memento if you want, but if you want to just bring yourself, that's the most important part. Um, so there is a, a wide breadth of difference between, between veterans and what they bring or don't bring. Some people bring their whole closet and they're like, I have five uniforms. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. And through the interview process, we we really simmer it down to the most. What is the the, uh, the the parameters and process uh, for for you know getting the word out to these people and selections and who you're shooting and how you're getting them and uh, and who you know who comes before your lens? Oftentimes, what I will do is partner with somebody on site in a city in a state, whether that's a library, a legion, or a church or a synagogue, and say, okay, we're going to do this date, and from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. I can fit. Uh, X number of veterans, whether that's 18 or 22, depending on timing. Um, and then what we'll do is I will create an online RSVP sheet and it's first come first serve. Once the names are filled, that's it. So it's very random, <laughs> um, which I love because I never know who's going to walk through my door. I have had, um, you know, lone survivors from Vietnam, you know, uh, Congressional Medal of Honor recipients, um, and then people like, uh, like Mickey, who went under the radar, you know, she served, uh, I think she served three years in the Marines. 
So uh, nobody would ever know her story had I not been able yeah. to photograph it. Now she's on display at the National Veterans Memorial Museum. Oh, I love that. And this picture I, I love because it's, you know, that's so symbolic of you know, the two hats she wears, you know, and uh, just moments like that are, are so amazing. Where I, I'm sure every single one of these people has uh, incredible stories, but was there one that kind of just like kind of took your breath away and that like, you're like, oh my God, this person. Yeah. <laughs> because you've well, met so okay. many of them that, you know, the one that does impress you, you know, that's the one I want to hear about. Um, so there was a uh, army vet. Uh, oh, oh gosh. Oh my, before I tell you that story, let me tell you about her. Um, this is Brenda White Bull. She is the great granddaughter of Sitting Bull. Oh my And gosh. I got to, I had, like I said, I don't know who's coming to, through my door and are into the studio. And I'm always like, oh my God. Um, you know, people talk about their heroes being basketball stars and, and Hollywood stars. Nope. Nope. No, 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 no. These, these are it right here. So anyway. I agree with you. I, I had moments, you know, so I got to shoot the, the very first uh, privately funded woman to go up into space. I got to shoot the very first uh, fighter pilot, a female fighter pilot who became a you know, brigadier general. And uh, and so those are the moment people you know, I've shot, you know, presidents and stuff, but those it was those people that uh, made the most impact on me and, and that I felt the most pride. So it's like, you know, something like you said, oh, you know, it must have been great to shoot, you know, Pete Souza. But no, it's like this moment talking to you is actually more meaningful to me in, in many, many ways. And uh, uh, so I, I understand that completely. And it, it, and it, it means so much, you know, that you're spending this time and, and sharing this with us. Because look at her. My God, <laughs> I just want to sit and talk with her. <laughs> yeah. This is Elizabeth Barker Johnson. She's from, um, she was from Hickory, North Carolina. She passed away this year. Um, mm. I mean, but she lived a really great full life. She was part of the, uh, an all African-American female unit that was serving on the front lines in the European theater during World War II. Is it strange? I mean, I, I don't want to get really political because, you know, I, it's not the place that I think here, but uh, having um, seen, served in the military, uh, live in this world outside the military, see that what's going on in the world today and, and, and know that this woman right here was part of an all black, you know, and, and where we are today in terms of, you know, division and, and everything that's happened just in this one year from, you know, Black Lives Matter to, you know, to a COVID to, you know, the president, the presidency and elections. So it's like, what is this year for you felt like? And like, how are you kind of, it's like, it seems like you've seen something like here it is, it's not that long ago that, you know, but have we changed that much as a country? Yeah. You know? I mean, that's hard to say. I know from my own little bubble that I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting so many incredible Americans and, you know, Elizabeth, she went into the military during a time of hard segregation only to come home, um, you know, and, and look at civil segregation, um, uh, you know, in her civilian life and, and overcoming that. And then only to be, you know, to pass away during a year of such tumult and not, yeah. you know, yeah. where are we? It, it, it saddens me. Yeah. Um, and I can't speak for the black voice because I have not walked a mile in their shoes. And I, all I know is that I was proud to serve along every person that volunteered regardless of race, color, or creed. And um, I think every person deserves the dignity and freedom that we, yeah. that we all, that we all share. And until we can all say that we have equality, then we shouldn't rest until that happens. Yeah. I, and, you know, it, for me, it's, it's, it goes so, it, sort of beyond that. It's like, we're at a point where Americans are fighting Americans right now. And, and you know, it's like the whole reason of, is the military is to protect America <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and all of us as a whole. And we're, we're, we're one team. We're not separate teams. We're, we're, we're one team. And that's uh, to see that, uh, you know, we're, we're so divided right and left right now. And it's, it's, that's the part that gets me the most. It's like, yeah. why can't we start with the similarities? And it seems like instantly that people go to instantly like, Oh, you're this or that. And like, this is our difference as well. You know well, what, if, if we never brought that up, we would probably be having a beer and you know, enjoying sports on the thing without, you know, ever bringing that up. Well, what, I mean, it, it feels like everybody's so concentrated on what divides us versus what, what yeah. unites us. And I, exactly. and I wish we could get back to that because yeah. it's not like we're all apple pie and baseball. That's not, it's not reality, yeah. but, yeah. but if we could just get over our own egos and to have a heartfelt dialogue and to accept each other for who we are, then maybe we can start 
yeah. in the right direction. I don't know. I, I wanted to pause on this picture because, you know, every once in a while you see these pictures and, and, and this, that, did he bring just all those pill bottles and, and, and just to show like, and that in its, itself is just, oh. Yeah, I think what I learned early on is um, in the teachings of photojournalism, there was always the, the first ethics to not interject yourself or your story or your voice. And what I found was that felt so disingenuous. By the nature of my being there, I was changing the, the dynamic anyway. Right. And how could I truly represent emotion and feeling without investing my emotions and feelings? Therefore, this picture to me, this is um, Mr. Grimes and he's from the Virginia, uh, state of Virginia. It, taking this picture was like taking a, a mirror image of myself. And it's because we had a shared experience that the answer, the answer was always just put some meds on it and you'll be okay. Here, if that didn't work, try these meds and then try these meds. I have a large box in my garage full of failed attempts. <laughs> and when he brought this in, it just struck me that that my experience wasn't wholly unique. And again, the Veterans Portrait Project, I never anticipated was going to be so cathartic and validating. And I met a kindred spirit in him. Oh. And another, you know, I'm sure you relate with this one very, very <laughs> I do. And this, yeah, this is Joe Worley with his um, service dog, Benjamin. And it was Joe Worley who talked me into applying for a service dog. So we definitely have a good connection. Yeah, I, I mean, it's so important. I deal with, I, I, I shoot, uh, donate my time and services to uh, heal our heroes. And it's, you know, it's trying to bring that, that suicide number down, which is, you know, just ghastly. And uh, you provide mental health and service dogs for, for things. So this for me, you know, hits very close to home and in, in, in seeing that and how important it is and how it changes people's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah, that's the face you want to see. <laughs> that smile. He's... So sweet. I met him. I was invited by the New England VA to go to the Big E Fair. Oh yeah, I've been Massachusetts. There. Have you been? That's, that's the way I tried, which I thought was the, the worst thing I've ever tried. I'm like, it's either going to be the best thing or the worst thing I've ever tried. Fried butter. <laughs> was it? What was it? I, was it good? It was. Uh, it's, it's this like sweet cream butter, and by the time it's fried, it kind of melts in there. So it's this fried dough, and you bite in, and the butter's in it. It's it was like amazing. <laughs> but. <laughs> I was always skeptical. Now I, have I was too. It was incredible. <laughs> well, for like three years, we would set up the studio outside on the street for the veterans appreciation. Oh, wow. At the Big E. And yeah, yeah. Um, I met this incredible World War II veteran um, among so many others who was brought in um, by the local VA home. Yeah, pretty great. And each one is... So what is this becoming a book or is it becoming... What, well, where else does this go? Well, I have exhibitions nationwide. Um, the exhibitions some, I know you have, but yeah, uh, some are permanent. But what I want to do is is do a book. I've just yeah. been trying to give myself. Twenty nineteen was intense. I did twenty, oh gosh, twenty eight states last year, and I was just really t <laughs> I was tired. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I th think I just needed to breathe for a minute, and um. You know, as, has 2020 been that for you? <laughs> yes. No, I mean, as crappy as COVID, the COVID situation has been. I'm going to pause on this one for a second. This oh, let me get back to it. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, Tommy Clack, the one you were just on. Yeah, I'm going to go back to it. Um, 2020 has allowed me the space to just kind of be decompress mm -hmm. um, and, and look at next steps because I'm in pre-production for a television series that I'll be hosting and producing. So you can talk about that now, right? Or no? I can, yes. Officially. Yeah, the last time I talked to you, you couldn't really talk about it. <laughs> yes, it's it's bona fide official. Um, yeah, yes, congratulations. Called, I'm so happy you. for you. Thank you. It's a show called After Action. And for PBS, premise, right? Yes. And yeah. the whole premise is to bridge the gap between the veteran community and those who support them. Because oftentimes there are really uncomfortable questions that need to be asked and we just don't know how to do it. Um, you know, we meet people like Tommy Clack, who I asked you to pause on this picture um, because to meet 
Tommy in public, it might be a little jarring because he's a veteran who has one limb. Yeah. So how do you know what's polite to ask and what not to ask? And how do you even start that dialogue? Well, Tommy was in Vietnam. He was a forward observer hit by um, an RPG and they brought the wounded back. He was pronounced dead and was put on the pile of the dead. The surgeon performing surgeries went about saving the lives of those he could save and afterwards stepped outside to have a cigarette. Something compelled him to go check on Tommy and it turns out that he had a faint pulse. So they brought him back into the surgery and saved his life. Um, sorry, this, it's like I'm having, um, I'm having a moment, like this fly keeps landing. It's that 2020 fly, I swear to God. Hopefully, yeah, um, that damn 2020 fly. <laughs> It's in my house. It's in my house. Huh. Um, anyway, so Tommy went on to live a very full life, have a, um, has a family. He lives in Columbus, Georgia, and is also um, does a lot of like outreach to help other veterans who are struggling. Um, but I think in allowing Tommy to have his voice heard and, and to talk openly will help demystify um, what we often think is more like closeted conversation um, and bring it out into the open. What would you be, well, your advice for people to, how, how, should they just be open and, and just be you know, honest and ask what they want to ask, right? You know, as long as it's with, with empathy or like, how, what would you want? You know, like, what would be your advice to people in, in, you know, kind of, you know, talking to these people and treating them the way they should be treated or how you would want to be treated, you know, that. I think, it depends on the individual. And I think it comes down to learning to read the room and mm -hmm. what's appropriate and what's not because for what could be okay for one veteran may not be for the next. Yeah. Um, I will say that no matter what, if you were genuine about your approach to whatever question you may have, the veteran will forgive you. Yeah. But there are there is a level of skepticism from the veteran community when when people approach them and ask certain questions like what's your agenda where are you coming from and oftentimes there is also a level of um mistrust in on that regard um that you don't know what you're talking about you haven't been there so if you approach your question in a way of um sincerity and maybe a little bit of naivety um there is there is a margin for forgiveness I hope that makes sense. Um, no, absolutely. And this brings us to the last last image that we have here, and then we'll just ask you some closing questions. And uh, but uh, well, I, I want to know about this image here. This gentleman is on um, is active duty army. I photographed him on the reservation in Warm Springs, Oregon, and um, he carries this tomahawk with him because all warriors um, uh, in, within his um, within his tribe, it is um, tradition to to have this tomahawk. So he's taken it all over Afghanistan wow. and back with him. So when when you say bring a memento, one never expects that they bring a, <laughs> a, a, a literal war implement. And he's used it downrange, um, maybe not against the enemy, but um, it's a part of him. So I just thought it was a, a really beautiful thing to incorporate. What was the most unexpected memento or, or uh, object that someone brought during these? A grenade pin. Oh, I'm sure there's quite a story Vietnam. behind that. Yes. Um, shrapnel that was pulled from their body. Yeah. Uh, what other mementos? Um, somebody brought their child. That's, their that's a good one. That's yeah, I mean, their, their baby was born while they were on deployment. That oh, was, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the discussion of where we're at and what you would like to see come from this, you know, it, what would you like to see, you know, the change or, 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 or someone walk away with from this project? I have learned a lot. I mean, it's been 12 years since I started the project and I'm, I'm a part of the veteran community and I've had my mind blown a thousand times over yeah. in the things that I didn't know. And I believe that with the Veterans Forger Project and my show like After Action, we can continue to educate ourselves about who the veteran community is, the history that has been woven by all of these small threads of stories, 
learn what we've done right, uh, adjust fire from what we've done wrong, and to improve the future for those who are to come. Yeah, I think that's the whole point. Leave the world better than where you found it. And I think the veteran community has a lot of that knowledge in abundance that we can share, that we don't share because we don't ask those questions and we don't talk about them openly. I think after action will definitely be very revealing for for the veteran community and for the civilians who support them. Well, we're going to do a little follow up when uh, yeah, and teaser to get that out to all my you know people and uh, for to premiere day we'll do a watch party or something. <laughs> I would love that. I, I would really enjoy that. Um, so, what would be if someone that would want to go into photography now? What would be like you know the one tip you give them that you wish someone gave to you when you were starting out? Don't be afraid of failure. I think I had concentrated so much on trying to to make great pictures that I lost sight of of the successes I was making from failure. I think yeah. it's okay to fail. Do you feel like you know, you'll be shooting, uh, you know, through a, uh, the camera lens until your last breath, or there'll be a point where you're like, no, I'm going to put it down and, and uh, <laughs> just relax the last couple of years. <laughs> no, I, I tend to miss it. I think I'll probably, I'll probably continue shooting to the end. Yeah. If, if my body will allow it. I'll be doing it. Right. <laughs> and uh, what's one of the best single pieces of advice that you, you've gotten in your life? And it could be anything from a parent, from anything that you always wanted to pass forward. Give it as freely as you got it. You know, um, you can't be intimidated by what other people may do with the knowledge you give them. You just have to know that you may be inspiring somebody who will change the world with what with what you've empowered with them. So give it as free as you got it. It's beautiful, beautiful. This is a question that I ask every single one of my uh, open talk guests, and uh, um, in the most honest and personal sense what is photography to you whoa wow um photography for me is identity it's who i am it's my story through others pictures like pictures of other people i suppose it's just that simple Every, everything that i capture is um the world around me so it inherently it's my story too that's beautiful. All right. This is a little speed round. So it's just whatever the top of your head, a couple of questions okay. on a scale of one to 10. How weird are you? 10. 10. Totally I like weird. that. What would you think your spirit animal would be? Gosh, I love, I love a good rhino. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, when I went over into Safari, that's the only of the big animals that I didn't see. And it, it kind of killed me the most not seeing them. I think they're incredible creatures. Um, what's your favorite holiday? Uh uh I, I love halloween because of all the really great shows i, yeah, love yeah. shows. So <laughs> I, I like i like the um the festivist season too i like christmas and yeah and yeah season. yeah um let's see uh what was the last oh, no no here's one uh what do you have a guilty pleasure tv show that you're like yeah i watched that <laughs> oh, oh gosh um, you know, I was watching Dr. Pimple Popper for a minute. Oh, like, no, oh, I can't even get myself to do like that how one. Gross it was. <laughs> I'm kind of over it. I'm like, I've had, it, I've had enough. Um, but I, I like anything British history, especially the Tudor era. So if there's like anything about Ken, Henry VIII, like in his six wives or however many wives he had, I'm like, I'll watch it. Oh. And that's going to bring us to our last question. I thank you so much for your time today. It was it was such a pleasure to sit and talk with you, and I look forward to you know doing it again sometime soon. But uh, in the last you know month or so, what was something that either made you really laugh or gave you hope for the future? Um, you know, I'm a very apolitical person. I I'm I don't have a dog in the fight, like yeah. left or right, and I, <laughs> and I don't talk about it on social media. But when I saw Kamala Harris. That, that gave me inspiration. Good, so. to, good to know. Where can people find your stuff? You can go to um, veteransportraitproject.com or stacypearsall.com or you can go on my podcast. Who is yeah, the, that's what uh, I never asked. What, how did this <laughs> podcast come about? Uh, everythingstacy.com. I, yes. I've been meaning to do it for a while. 2020 <laughs> gave me the space to do it. So here it is. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And you have to listen to it because if you've listened to her here, she just goes even better into more stuff. So you have to, have to, have to, I want to thank you so much. I wish you only the very best and may 2021 be even more of a banner year than ever, ever, ever. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> it can only go up from here. Y'all. I know. I know. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. 